I know we've got two more sonnets by Shakespeare. We're not going to go over them. I want you to know them. However, um, 130 and 129, I think they were we finished with 116, uh, whatever day that was, last Thursday. Um, today, we're going to start with Ben Johnson's epitaph on Shakespeare. Um, I, dro I dropped from the syllabus the poem to John Donne. And I'm going to leave on the syllabus. For right now, we're not going to discuss On My First Daughter and On My First Son um, just because of the constraints of time. So we're going to do the epitaph on Shakespeare and then go on to some done stuff. If by the end of the last day of class, the Tuesday, uh, we have time, then maybe we'll come back and talk about a couple of them. Um, couple of the things that we end up not discussing in class. Because those aren't going to be the only things. Simply because we're so short on time. Now, last Thursday, in talking about Shakespeare, we talked about the anti-Stratfordians. Those who said William Shakespeare Stratford on Avon did not write the plays. Or the poems. They kind of argue that when Johnson wrote this Epitaph, um, he did it knowing it was essentially a lie. That is, that, that some of them at least argue that Johnson was in on the charade and that this was all part of, you know, building up the fiction that the guy from Stratford was the author. Okay? Uh, we do know Johnson and, and Shakespeare, not only were they contemporaries, but they were rivals. I mean, they, they wrote plays at the exact same time. They wrote poetry um, at the exact same time. A uh, little bit different background. Johnson was the son of a bricklayer. Shakespeare was the son of a glover. That is, they both came from, quote unquote, blue collar uh, backgrounds. But Johnson attended the most prestigious, prestigious uh, preparatory school in London. And at that school, and then university, um, at that school, you know, got the greatest education there was. Right? So let's look at, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. Johnson begins <clears throat> begins kind of with a no, I don't know how to put it. So we'll just start. To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book and fame? While I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much, tis true in all men's suffrage. So, he says, your name, your writings, are such as no man nor muse can praise too much. When you think you've reached the highest praise possible, keep going. Okay? And notice, it's not just men, the muses also. There are nine muses. Nine goddesses of poetry, if you want, or literature. Tis true in all men's suffrage, that is, all men would agree. But these ways were not the paths I meant unto thy praise. In other words, scratch that. That's not how I meant to begin this poem of praise. For silliest ignorance on these may light. That is, the most foolish unlearned person could come up with this. Because, I mean, you could walk down the street in Murfreesboro and go, you know, Shakespeare. People go, oh, man, Shakespeare. You know? Even though they've never read any Shakespeare whatsoever or seen any Shakespeare. Okay? Which, when it sounds at best, but echoes right. That is, Shakespeare. Or blind affection. 
which doth ne'er advance the truth, but gropes and urgeth all by chance. Or crafty malice, that is, someone with ill intent might pretend this praise and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. That is, someone might try to damn you with faint praise. Hmm. These, these examples, the silliest ignorance, the blind affection, the crafty malice, these are as some infamous bod or whore should praise a matron. What could hurt her more? So, some infamous, by that meant famous, but in a negative sense. Some famous bod, a madam, Heidi Fleiss, uh, the L.A. madam who had her little black book published several years ago. Man, a long time ago now. 20 years probably. Um, you know, with names of stars and all that kind of stuff. Or the, the madam, I can't remember her name, in Washington, D.C., politicians, judges, you know. It'd be like having someone like that praising, what does she call? A matron. That is a older, established woman of society whose name is pure as snow. So, you know, if you are Mother Teresa, do you really want Kim Kardashian singing your praises? Probably not. Because, you know, we kind of... So, thou art proof against them. And indeed, above the ill fortune of them or the need, I therefore will begin. So everything before I therefore will begin is kind of like, eh, this is me brainstorming. I am trying to get where I want to go. So how does he begin? Soul of the age. The age is the sphere. Shakespeare is the soul, or the ruling intelligence of that sphere. He's the guiding intelligence. And that sphere used to be called, for a long time, the Shakespearean age. It's also called what? The Elizabethan age. So, you know, conflicting sphere, uh, spheres. Not spears, spheres. So, Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. So, Johnson there, as playwright, is saying, you are the applause, you are the delight, and you are the admiration of our stage. Well, this is pretty good praise coming from a fellow playwright. Johnson's plays are performed today, but they're usually performed more as peculiarities rather than because people really want to see them. When people go to see Midsummer Night's Dream in the summer, they're going because they just love that play. When people go see Every Man in His Humor, they're going in more because, you know, it's a good Jacobean play and, you know, you can learn some stuff from it. It's not because... The characterization is so good, or the plot is so good, or the imagery is so good, as it is with most of Shakespeare's plays. My Shakespeare, rise. Notice, it's kind of like, Lazarus, come forth, you know. I want you to come back. Now, when's he writing this? It's published in 1623, in the first folio. Shakespeare's been dead for seven years. You know what else has kind of been dead for seven years? Actually, longer than seven years. Because Shakespeare left London about 1611 to 1613, somewhere in that time frame. He's published in 1623. Shakespeare's been off the stage, that is, as actor and as playwright. He's been out and away from London for 10 years. What's been going on in that 10-year period? Well, Johnson's going to refer to it later, but the stage, which had once been like this, it's now like this, and it's moving this direction, okay? 
Part of that is the style of plays are changing. Okay. Johnson is writing at this point what are called masks, which are these highly ornate with huge costuming kind of things. Think of it as a, you know, a Hollywood extravaganza um, as opposed to a more bare bones kind of production as you would have with the Shakespeare stuff. So, my Shakespeare rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. He's talking about Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey and he's not going to say, Chaucer, budge over there, you know. Let's, let's create some room for Will here. No, no, he says. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art still alive, and art a light still, alive still, while thy book doth live. Why? Well, what does he say throughout the sonnets? As long as men live and have eyes to see, as long these live these lines, and these lines give life to thee, as long as this book is here, you're alive. Okay? So we don't need to make space for you in Poets Corner, though there is going to Westminster Abbey today, and there is Shakespeare kind of up on the wall. And by the way, if you've never been to Westminster Abbey and you go into Poets Corner, you can't help but walk on some dead guy. I mean, it's the whole place is just paved with, you know, they're down below. But. So, and art alive still while that book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. Notice the, while thy book doth live, and we have which to read and praise to give. Those are all conditions. You're only alive as long as what? As long as uh, your work is still around. You know? As long as your work is still around, and as long as we have wits, meaning intellect. Oh, don't get me going, because we'll never finish this book. I gotta say it. As long as English departments are smart enough to still require courses in Shakespeare, because you can graduate with an English degree from, from MTSU without having taken this course or without having taken any Shakespeare. Your only introduction to Shakespeare, your only reading of Shakespeare can be in like the Brit in, in the Britlet one course in this one. You don't have to take my intro to Shakespeare or Donovan's later early Shakespeare, okay? And that's the course throughout most departments of English. Shakespeare is no longer required. I would argue we've lost our wits. The greatest writer in the English language. That would be like somebody raised in Greece, studying at the University of Athens, studying Greek literature, and never reading Sophocles. Or Aeschylus or Euripides. It's utterly unfathomable. Or, you know, studying chemistry and never learning anything about Boyle. Or studying physics and never learning anything about, oh, I don't know, Einstein. You, you can't do that, okay? So, the wits part, we're not, we've got the book. <laughs> Thankfully, we can still read. For most of us, there are some that. Struggle. Mm -hmm. Have wits to read and praise to give. So, that I not mix thee so, that is, with Chaucer or Spencer or Beaumont. Beaumont is, by the way, Beaumont and Fletcher were um, a pair of writers that Shakespeare helped a little bit. We've got a manuscript, one of their plays. Shakespeare's handwriting is in it. Okay. <clears throat> So that I not mix thee so, my brain excuses. I mean, with great but disproportioned muses. For if I thought my judgment were of yours, I should commit thee surely with thy peers. Okay? Because he's mixed up the peers in the previous line. Why? Well, Chaucer died in 1400. Spencer died in, I want to say, 1590. I don't remember what year. Fletcher. Beaumont died in 1660. Same year as Shakespeare. Okay? So those are kind of disproportioned mixed muses. So he says, no, 
if I were going to commit you with your years, then, then I would have to put you with people from your own time period, such as, and tell how far thou didst our lily outshine. Okay? John Lilly, 1554 to 1606. He was known for his plays, not very much. He was also known for his what were, what are now kind of called novels, Euphues or his Golden Legacy. And Lily created this style of writing, highly ornate, called Ciceronian. Why? Because he mimicked Cicero. Today we would call it purple prose. That is, it's just exceedingly florid. It just goes on and on in the description. Okay? Who else? Or Sporting Kid, Thomas Kidd, Spanish Tragedy, okay? as well as many others. Or Marlowe's Mighty Line, you know? Christopher Marlowe, 1564 to 93. So I would compare you with these guys. And though thou had small Latin or less Greek, or and less Greek, okay, notice, by Johnson standards, this means something less than erudite and expert fluency. The anti-Stratfordians take that, and they say that Johnson is saying <clears throat> Shakespeare barely knew Latin and hardly any Greek at all. Not what he means. He means, compared to me, Ben Johnson, and I'm like a classicist, okay? So, and though thou had small Latin and less Greek, from thence to honor me, I would not seek for names. I would not seek. That is, I wouldn't have to go back through the roll of classical authors and say, let's see now, who could we compare Shakespeare to? Shoot, that's a hard one. No, the names just rattle right off his lips, but call forth thundering Aeschylus. Euripides, Sophocles, to us, the three greats. I mean, these are like the trinity of Greek tragedians. Pacuvius, Accius, him of Cordova dead. And you've got glasses there. To life again, to hear thy buskin tread and shake a stage. Okay, those are all tragedians. You've got your gloss about the buskin, worn by actors in Greek tragedies, and so it met him for tragic dramas. So, Euripides, uh, Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, those are the big three, the others, derivative, if you want. Okay? Or, if thy socks were on, he says, when thy socks were on, another gloss, shoes worn by actors in Greek and Roman comedies. What? Who would I look for? When thy socks were on, leave thee alone for the comparison of all the insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth. That is, you wouldn't compare with anybody. Why? They are all beneath you. So, no Greek or Roman comic authors even come close to Shakespeare. Triumph my Britain. Nah, good old nationalistic fervor. Yeah, Shakespeare, he's one of us, you know. Can you Triumph, my Britain, thou hast won to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. All scenes of Europe, all playwrights who ever portrayed anything set in Europe, they all owe homage to you. They all, whether they're dead or now alive, and I think he's even saying or even in the future, what do they have to do? They, oh, Shakespeare, you know. They've got to come bow down to you. He was not of an age before all time. That's why I said, and even those who come after. And all the muses were still in their prime when, like Apollo, he came forth to warm our ears, or like a Mercury to charm, okay? Apollo, Mercury, gods of poetry and excellence. The muses were in their prime. What does that mean? And the muses, goddesses of poetry, in their prime, they were at their strongest influence. Okay? 
These were, if you were to portray them as women, as they often were, young, gorgeous, desirable. They weren't ugly old crones and hags going, here, pal, let me give you this idea about sex, you know. No, they were what? They were able to snap their fingers and the proverbial light bulb goes off. So, nature herself was proud of his designs. Nature liked how Shakespeare portrayed nature. Enjoyed to wear the dressing of his lines. Beautiful line if you think about it. The dressing of his, how he portrayed flowers, trees, etc. Which were so richly spun and woven so fit as since she as since she will vouchsafe no other wit. Now that's showing a bit of envy on Johnson's part. A bit of jealousy on Johnson's part. That's Johnson the playwright saying, damn it, Bill, nature gave you everything. And she doesn't do what? She doesn't go, here, Jr. you have a little bit of my influence, so you can paint a pretty flower too. Uh-uh. Rest of us, we, we can't do nature. And Johnson's plays are extremely artificial. Okay, you read a Shakespeare play, you see a Shakespeare play, and it's what? It's immediately believable. Why? Because it's as if it's real. Because as Hamlet says, the purpose of playing is to hold a mirror, because if you look at that, it's like a mirror, up to nature. That's what he's doing. So, he goes on. She joyed, and nature joyed to wear the dressing of his lines, which were so richly spun and woven so fit, as since, as since, that is since Shakespeare, she will vouchsafe no other wit. The merry Greek, Tart Aristophanes, wrote the clouds, wrote frogs, wrote Lysistrata, okay? Neat Terence, Roman, witty Plautus, now not please. They don't bring pleasure now, but antiquated and deserted lie as they were not of nature's family. He's saying they're dull and boring. Nobody ever says any of Shakespeare's comedies are dull or boring. Right? Even the worst of them, like Comedy of Errors. It's one of his earliest comedies. It's taken not to be one of his best ones. But it is rip-roaringly funny because of the confusion of, you know, the two sets of twins and that kind of stuff. Yet must I not give nature all? Thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. Why? I must not give nature all. What if Johnson did give nature all? That he would be saying about Shakespeare that he's one of those people I just absolutely hate. And there are some writers like this who could just literally sit down, piece of paper, quill, write it all down, perfect first draft. Samuel Johnson was, was said to be like this. John Milton was said to be like this. John Milton, by the time he got around to writing Paradise Lost, was totally blind. He dictated it to his daughter and had it right up here. Okay. Samuel Johnson, according to evidence, wrote uh, Rasmus, or Prince of Abyssinia, while he had somebody, printer, banging on his door for copy to print he wrote it and printed it quickly for, I think it was his mother's, for his mother's funeral. And he was literally writing a page at a time, handing that to his boy. His boy was taking it to the door for the printer's boy to take. So they were running off pages. One draft. Perfect. Okay? Absolutely disgusting. Not fair. What's Johnson's point? Because he says, 
Jesus. <laughs> Yet must I not give nature all. Thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. For though the poet's matter nature be, that is, the stuff the poet works with is nature. Nature how? Well, each of you are nature. These desks, as horrid as it is to think about it, are nature. The world around us is nature. Okay, So that's the stuff. For though the poet's matter and nature be, his art doth give the fashion. That is, the poet's technical ability does what? Dresses it all up. He's telling us something about Shakespeare because people tend to think Shakespeare was kind of the writers I described earlier. That he was, you know, he is the ideal of the romantic poet. Stuffed up in his garret, starving, writing this great poetry, writing these great plays and then having them produced without having to work at it. Well, Johnson's going to say, not true. His art doth give the fashion. And that he who cast to write a living line. Okay, notice that phrase. He who cast to write a living line. Who is that he? It's not necessarily Shakespeare. That refers to everybody. It refers to all of you. Why? Because all of you, hopefully, God being your helper, you will write living lines in your papers for me. You don't want them to be dead. You know what happens to dead papers? They go in the circular file, you know. They get dead grades, F. <laughs> so you want living lines, good lines. He that cast to write a living line must do what? Sweat. Must sweat. Such as thine are, Shakespeare's lines are living, must sweat and strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil. What's the second? What's the first heat? He says you have to strike the second heat. So what's the first heat? The line. No. Close. Is it trying to be the first one? No. I mean, it could be. Closer. The inspiration. The inspiration. That's the first heat. The first heat is J.K. Rowling on a train. Manchester, England to London. She's penniless. She's unmarried. She has a child. She's living on Scottish welfare. And one moment, she has no idea. And literally, the next minute, she has an idea of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were killed by the most powerful dark wizard who ever lived, and that powerful dark wizard is after him. Where did the idea come from? Because she was a sitter one. <laughs> trying to make that idea. So where did it come from? Where do novelists get the ideas for their novels? And more importantly, why didn't that idea Happened to Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I changed it because I usually go, me, you know. Because <laughs> she goes from being penniless to, in a span of 15 years, 10 years from the time the first book is published, from being penniless to being the richest woman in the United Kingdom. Wealthier than the Queen. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Okay, so the first heat is the inspiration. Where's the idea come from? J.R.R. Tolkien, summer of 1931, he's grading entrance exams to, Harvard, to um, Oxford. He's got a blue book in front of him. He reads the student's response. He turns the page. There's a blank page, and he writes in pencil. I've held this thing in my hand before I looked at it. And he writes in pencil, and he'll hold it around and look to Hobbit. And then he goes on to the next page and starts marking that one. He has no idea what a hobbit is. 
where did it come from? And then he goes home and he starts thinking about that. It's a hot breath. And he starts fashioning a story and he starts telling the story to his children and the story developed. Middle Earth and all that had already been created. How the Hobbit is connected, all that comes later. Where did, that's the first hint. Poetic inspiration. That's why all poets call it inspiration. What does inspiration mean? Breathing in. It's not that kind of breathing in. It's something outside Breathing in. It's the idea back in the book of Genesis about God breathing in the spirit of life to Adam. Okay? That's the first heat. So what's the second heat? He who cast to write a living line must sweat such as thine are and strike the second heat upon the muses and them. Well, J.K. Rowling had to take that idea and go, okay, now where did that come from? And start fleshing it out. C.S. Lewis, for a period of about 20 years, had these recurrent dreams. And in one of those dreams was a great tawny lion. And another one was an image of a fawn with an umbrella carrying packages in snow. And these dreams kept coming to him. And he's like, what the hell? Because <laughs> he didn't know what it meant. And he finally meets the woman who becomes, his life, who becomes his wife, and it all clicks into place. Okay? The second heat, that's the work. That's taking the idea and putting it to paper and going back and revising. Look, you can, you can look at, I'm pretty sure I'm Look online at, at um, Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. You can buy a facsimile of the manuscript for 10 bucks. It's a Dover edition publication. And look at A Christmas Carol and look at the manuscript changes. He's going through crossing stuff out, changing things, rearranging. Okay? The nice thing, I used to be a text scroller. What does that do? That shows us the process in the mind of the author as the thing takes shape. Okay. Turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame. Johnson is saying, Shakespeare, folks, he had to work at his plays. Or for the laurel, he may gain a score. That is, if you don't, professor, teacher, if you don't revise your papers, if you think... They're due at 940 on what day? The 27th. They're due at 940 on the 27th. So I'm going to be in a lab somewhere at 915 putting those last words to it. You might gain a scorn rather than a laurel. For a good poet's made as well as born. A lot of people skip that second half. He is saying a good poet is born. But then what? Then you have to work. Usain Bolt was born to run the 100 and 200 meters. Is that it? Did he never have to do anything else? Michael Jackson was born to play basketball. But what if a basketball had never been put in his hand? Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. He was born to sing. He was born to move. Okay. Michael Jordan was. But what if a ball had never been put in his hand? He would never know. But did he never have to practice? Nope. He had to practice hours. Same thing goes for anybody who masters a quote-unquote art. So, a good poet's made as well as born, and such wert thou. That is, you were born a poet, Bill, and you made yourself 
the greatest. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. And I think that's Johnson telling us, yeah, I know who wrote the sonnets. What are those first 18 or so sonnets all about? Go have children. Why? Because it would be a, a miscarriage if you didn't reproduce yourself so that your beauty lived on. You want to see Shakespeare, Johnson is telling us. Look at the plays. Probably end poems. Right? Even so, the race of Shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines in his well-turned and true-filed lines. Well-turned, true-filed. Anybody know what imagery he's using there? It's woodworking and metalworking. Well turned is the image of wood on a lathe. And you turn the lathe and you apply a cutting edge to it. And what do you do? You turn a square block round. And you might put what are called coves and beads on it. Beads is a thing like that. A cove is a hollow, like a chair leg or a table leg. Okay? Well filed. Do you make a sword merely by getting a big old hunk of steel and heating it up? No. What do you have to do? You have to hammer it into shape. You have to get the edges thin or a knife, you know. And then what do you have to do? You have to file them to get them sharp. Okay. So what does that mean for poetry? You turn the lines how? You remove the excess. Shakespeare writes what kind of verse? What meter? The ambic pentameter. Pentameter means what? Five. Five feet, ten syllables. What if you have eleven? Well, that's not well turned. What do you have to do? You gotta shave off a little bit. How does he often do that? Yeah. <laughs> he joins two words with an apostrophe. Even two words that don't really work well, he sometimes does. Okay? What if you have nine syllables? You had the grave accent. Ed. Talk Ed. Walk Ed. Not te Ed. It's my wife's family from South Georgia. <laughs> In each of these, notice a little pun here. He seems to shake a lance, line 69. Shake, lance. As brandished at the eyes of ignorance. Now, that could be Johnson dealing already with some people saying, well, maybe he didn't really write the poems. And the eyes of ignorance are those who say, there is no way on God's green earth some country bumpkin from Stratford wrote these plays who did not attend Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Sweet Swan of Avon. Why would he say he's from Avon if he wasn't from Avon? Unless you're saying this is Johnson going, wink, wink, guys, we all know he wasn't really from there. But I'll, I think this is ludicrous. Sweet Swan of Avon. What a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear. That is now. It's been six years. Excuse me, seven years. To see thee in our waters yet appear and make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our gems. It wasn't Thames and James. It would have been pronounced probably uh, gems. Swans, by the way, royal bird. Can't kill them, even if they're in your own property. If you have a pond and there are swans, guess what? They belong to the crown, which is a, you know, why it's a serious offense to kill a swan. Still, supposedly. But stay. I see thee in the hemisphere. So it's kind of like, oh, look, there's a swan. Oh, let's call that one Bill. You know, reminds me of. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere. What's happened? He's just elevated Shakespeare from our realm 
to be godlike. This is Shakespeare's apotheosis. That's a P. Made into a god. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere advanced and made a constellation there. Well, what do constellations do? They look down on us. They shine their lights upon us. Shine forth, thou star of poets. What will Shakespeare be? Well, he's the soul of the age. So poets, new image, poets are the sphere. Shakespeare will be their soul. What's he just turned Shakespeare into? Something that Anne Bradstreet's brother-in-law essentially did to her. Anne Bradstreet is the first American poet, 1670s. Her brother-in-law took a copy of her manuscript of poetry when he was visiting her, went to England, published it, and published it with the title The Tenth Muse. Kind of like nine wasn't enough. Here's a new one. And then he brought it back. And then she wrote a series of poems about my brother-in-law is pretty stupid. I mean, he was kind, but not true. Why? Because he took this, you know, and I didn't really mean for it to be. And then she writes more poems and republishes it and becomes the first published poet. So, shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage. Rage or influence, chide or cheer. Why? Okay, one, he's calling him a star of poets. That is, you're the new inspiration. You're the new muse. Why? Apollo's dead. I mean, let's face it. Apollo's dead. Mercury, gone. Do something, Shakespeare. This is kind of like Dylan Thomas in Do Not Go Gentle in That Good Night. Where he says, rage, rage against the nine of the light. Or, in another line, he says, do something, father. Okay. With rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping. If the stage is drooping, he's not talking about the literal stage. Metaphorically, the stage should be living and thriving instead. It's dying. So rage, come on, you guys. This is the English stage. I haven't been dead that long. Suck it up. That's rage. Cheer. Come on, boys. Pom-poms, you know. If Ben can't do it, no one can. Kind of. <laughs> Which, since thy flight from hence. Now, when was this flight from hence? 1616 when he died? Or 1611 when he left. Hath mourned. The stage hath mourned like night and despair's day. But for thy volume's light. What's the light of Shakespeare's volume? Volume simply means book. It might mean the first folio. I don't think so, though. His genius. Could be. The stage droops except for when one of your plays is being produced. That's the only, Johnson is implying, that's the only saving grace. Now, it's not very long after this, 1642, playhouses are closed down all, all together by the Puritans. And they're closed from 1642 until 1660. 18 years. So there's a lot of pent-up frustration, you know, Player playwrights secretly writing plays so that when the restoration occurs the playhouses are open again you get a whole bunch of plays and you have restoration playwrights writing from roughly 1660 yeah they're writing up through the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries etc but they're not most of them aren't very good so the major periods in, you know, in English playwriting history are the Elizabethan period, the Restoration period, 
in the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay? Three kind of great periods. Because most of the 18th century, the plays that are being performed, nobody performs those today. You know, kiss pity, she's a whore, and things like that. They're, they're boring. Okay, Johnson's done. So let's go to, like I said, we're going to skip honest, um, first daughter and honest first son for now. So let's go to Dunn. Dunn is a contemporary of Shakespeare and Johnson. Dunn's born 1572, eight years younger than Shakespeare. Dies in 1631. Little, just real briefly about Dunn. I mentioned, you know, Johnson, son of a bricklayer. Dunn's father. I completely forgot. Dunn's family, historically um, Catholic. He had an uncle who had to flee England, go to the continent. He had a brother who was arrested. Dunn's wife, Anne Dunn, um, had as a great great uncle Sir Thomas More. Her name was Anne More. Thomas More was killed by Henry VIII. Why? Because he didn't go along with the divorce of Catherine of Aragon. Okay? So, I mean, she got, you know, martyr on her family. Um, Dunn in the six, early 1690s took part in what are called the Spanish Expeditions. These were little skirmishes and wars against Spain. Okay? So he was a soldier. Um, we think he attended... Oxford for a while, but he never took a degree. It's probable that he didn't take a degree because he would not swear the oath of supremacy, which is that the English church is the only church. Probably because of still being Catholic. In 1600, or in the late 1590s, he becomes secretary to Thomas Edgerton, who is the keeper of the seal. One of the most powerful positions in English government, um, because what's the seal? That's the seal the king uses to signify things are official. Okay, so Dunn becomes his secretary. By the late 1590s, Dunn has already established a name for himself as a poet, but he hasn't published anything. So how do you establish your name, a name for yourself as a poet, without having published anything? He has patrons who pay him, and he writes some poems. And these poems get copied, and they're circulated. John uh, Johnson, we've got the poem in here, to John Dunn. Johnson says that Dunn replaces Apollo as a muse. I mean, he's essentially saying... You did it, Dunn. You, you killed Apollo off. You're the best thing there is for poetry. Okay? Um, Johnson had some other words about Dunn. Maybe I'll tell you on Tuesday when we come back because we're running a little short on time. Um, Dunn wrote a series of satires in the 1590s. Wrote five satires. Satire 3, which is in your book, I think it's in your book, is the greatest of them. It's called On Religion. Where Dunn essentially asks the question, what's the true church? Is it the one in Rome? Is it the one in Switzerland or Geneva, Calvinism? Or is it here in London? And he essentially answers the question by saying, I don't know. But you have to search for it, and that's what's important. Now, that's a pretty radical idea. I don't know what the true church is. Go find it yourself. But it's also entirely Protestant. Okay? 1600, as I mentioned, Dunn is working for Thomas Edgerton. And Dunn is 20, what, he's 28 in 1600, because he was born in 1572. And he marries in 1600. Let's see if the book gives her age. Yeah, 1601, he marries Edgerton's niece, Anne. 
Anne Moore, daughter of Sir George Moore. She's 17. Okay, he went to work for Edgerton in 1597. When he was, take four from 28, he was 24, and she was 13. It's thought that that's probably when they meet. Okay. He's got a bunch of sonnets, a bunch of poems, excuse me, not sonnets, a bunch of poems about a guy and a girl meeting, marrying, and it being secret. Well, their marriage was a secret. When he married, he was 28, she was 17. Uh, their marriage was secret for about three months. And when their marriage became public, uh, one, he was immediately fired. Two, he was immediately thrown in jail by her father. I think he was in jail for three or four months. You can read all their correspondence. It's at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Letters between Dunn and his father-in-law about, you know, stuff. Um, he's released, and she's pregnant, and they start having kids. So, 1601, she dies in 1617. That's 16 years. During that 16 years, she has 12 pregnancies. And if I remember right, something only like seven of those or eight of those are live births. Seven in book. The rest are stillborn. Okay? One of Dunn's greatest poems, one that um, I've got on the syllabus, Valediction for Many Morning. According to Isaac Walton, Dunn's first biographer, um, he wrote as he was getting ready to take a journey on the continent, and she wanted him to stay, and she had a premonition something bad was going to happen. She was pregnant at the time. He goes, stillbirth. So he should have stayed home. Um, what else? 1603, King... James becomes king, and I've told you before, he fancied himself a scholar, and he liked Dunn. He liked Dunn so much that he kept him from getting a job. That is, he wanted Dunn to be his chaplain. This is before Dunn's a priest. Right? Dunn tries to hold off. He goes to work as a secretary for a guy named Charles Drury, uh, Sir Robert Drury, excuse me, and you know, worked for him for a long while. And in 1615, Dunn finally does take holy orders. Okay? That is, he becomes an Anglican priest. Now, earlier, around 1610, 1611, Dunn writes some anti-Catholic stuff. Real anti-Catholic. Like he writes this, this tract, essentially, called St. Ignatius, his conclave, that is, his meeting. And where is it? It's set in hell. This is Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. Okay? Dunn's uncle was a Jesuit. His brother was a Jesuit. Dunn puts the Jesuits in hell, essentially. Okay? But he does become an Anglican priest in 1615. And in that year, he writes a letter to a friend named Henry Goodyear. My dissertation was on Dunn, so. Um, and in that letter, he asks Henry Goodyear for that little book of poems back. That is, a manuscript book of Dunn's poems. He says, I'm getting ready to take holy orders, and I want to make a valediction of my previous life. That is, a saying farewell to the poetry he had written up to that period. And what we think, Dunn scholars think, is that Dunn is essentially saying, give me that book of secular poetry that I wrote back. Why? So I can publish it. He never does. And we have no idea where that book is. We have a bunch of manuscripts, some fairly complete, of almost all of Dunn's poems. None of them are in Dunn's own handwriting. None of them can be placed in the ownership of Henry Goodyear. There's one manuscript that we can place really close to Dunn because it was written by one of Dunn's closest friends. It's called the Westmoreland Manuscript. It's in 
the New York Public Library. Okay? So, Dunn becomes a priest, and seemingly from that moment on, he only, write, only writes religious verse. Primarily funeral verse. That is, he writes poems to commemorate XYZ's funeral. Okay? Doesn't mean he doesn't write some religious poetry before, but he, because he does. But again, according to, to um, Isaac Walton, his first biographer, we have a division of Dunn. That is, there are actually two John Dunn's. There is what Johnson called Jack Dunn, the Rake of London. Rake just means licentious person he got around. Okay? Jack Dunn, the Rake of London, and Dr. Dunn, Dean of St. Paul. He was made Dean of St. Paul's, I think in 1623. Wait, what is it, 1621? It's one of those two years. I think it's 1621. So he takes holy orders in 1650. What Walton essentially argues is up until he takes holy orders, Dunn got around. That is, even after he's married. Okay? But after he takes holy orders, he's on the tried and true path. Hardly anybody believes this division anymore. So we've got not a lot, but a few poems by Dunn. Why more people read Dunn today than they read Johnson? Because Dunn's fun to read. For the simple reason that Dunn gives you all kinds of images, and he likes to turn things on their head. Johnson said in a couple of conversations two things about Dunn. Dunn, for not keeping of accent, deserved hanging. Not keeping of accent. Iambic pentameter. That is, Dunn changes it up a bit. And he also said, what was the other thing? Not keeping accent is retaining, and that Dunn would not be read outside his lifetime. Because he was hard to read. Okay? Well, Dunn is read more today by far than Ben Johnson. Um, later 17th century, all of the 18th century, Dunn's poetry wasn't read very much. It was his sermons. Big, massive collections. In Dunn's sermons, if you go to church today, what's considered a long sermon? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, hour. Dunn's could go for three or four hours. And he would pack St. Paul's. That is, people went to hear Dunn's sermons not for the great spiritual edification, but for the mental fireworks, the mental gymnastics, to try to keep in mind everything he's doing. Because his sermons were like building a house. Takes the footing, pours the footing, lays the foundation, builds the floor, builds the walls, puts the ceiling joists, puts the second floor on, another ceiling, third, he just keeps a building, a building, a building. His poems, Largely do the same. So let's look at what's the first one? Page. Am I going to do all of these? Probably not. Um, yeah, we'll do this one. Do um, page 915, The Good Morrow. I told myself I wasn't going to do this one, but I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Notice right there, keeping of accent, just throw it out the window. Were we not weaned till then? But sucked on country pleasures childishly, or snorted we in the seven sleepers' den? Twas so. But this all pleasures fancies be. If ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, twas but a dream of thee. We'll take these stanza by stanza. So I wonder by my troth, that is my truth, no, not really, my troth, my pledge to you. 
my engagement to you, if you want. But it is also true. When thou and I did till we loved, what did we do before we loved each other? That's what the speaker is saying. He's not saying, oh, baby, I never loved anybody else. No, you're my first. Ah, just the opposite. Were we not weaned till then? Well, if, you're, if you wean something, what are you doing? You're taking it off of, okay? But sucked on country pleasures. So if what they did before meeting each other were country pleasures, country means unrefined, okay? simplistic, but now they're sucking fine pleasures, ref refined pleasures, I should say, uh, but sucked on country pleasures childishly. Or snorted we in the seven sleepers den, and you've got a gloss there, early Christian legend, seven years walled up in a cave, etc. Twas so, yep, it was. That's exactly what it was. What's the image? Before you and I met, we were like those people in Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Everybody familiar with Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Okay, most of you are nodding your heads. If you're not, look it up. Or if one of my lectures online has it. Um, but this, that is, except for this, all pleasures, fancies be, if ever any beauty I did see. Except for this, what? You and I together. All pleasures that I had before, they were like fancies, fantasies. They were imaginary. If ever any beauty I did see before I met you and desired a God, that is, and enjoyed, had sex with, it was a dream of you. No, 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 that wasn't important. That was just an image, it's very platonic, of you. Because if there's an image, then there must be what? There must be a reality. There's got to be something else, more real. That's you. And now, good morrow to our waking souls. What did Plato teach? Pre-existence of the soul. That's why, by the way, Socrates could go around and ask people troubling, disturbing questions. That's why he could reason with people and pull out of them the Pythagorean theorem. Why? Because their soul already knew that. Knew? Wow. <laughs> because their soul already knew that. How? Because it existed in eternity before being do born down here. Theoretically, if that's true, your soul then knows what? Everything. You could do E equals MC squared before Einstein. All you needed? The right questioner. Okay? I think there are some basic problems with the Socratic method. But. <coughs> and now, good morrow to our waking souls. Now we are what? We are fully awake. Now we're not dreaming which watch not one another out of fear. See, the dreaming souls, those that aren't fully awake, say when one's about to leave the room, where are you going? What, what are you doing? Who are you going to see? When? Where? I want to know where you are. And they set their phone so that they track you. Know? Mm -hmm. Why? For love, all love of other sites controls. Now that's eerily similar to Shakespeare's Sonnet 116. All love of other sites controls. In other words, real love doesn't care less, you know, rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Why? Because we have real love. True Marriage of true minds. For love, all love of other sites controls and makes one little room in everywhere. Probably should have done this on it. Not 129, 131? No, 135 by Shakespeare. 
Um, one little room in everywhere. What's the speaker saying? If you have me, let's assume the speaker is male, speaking to a female. The male speaker, let's say his name is John. No, don't. I don't want you to confuse him with Don. Let's say his name is Bernard. And Bernard says, hey baby, if you have Bernard, then you don't need John and Fred and Bill and Tom and Dick and Harry and any other men. Why? I am, you know, makes one little room and every, that is, this little room, it's what? It's every little room. All those little rooms, they are images of this room. Let's see discoverers to new worlds have gone. Why? Seek out, you know what Star Trek say? Bold new, you know, worlds, etc. Let maps to others, worlds on worlds have shown. That is, maps do what? On a piece of paper, they show you new worlds. They show you new lands. Your gloss, probably astronomical maps. Let us possess one world. Many manuscript versions, our world. I'm not sure that's true. I don't remember looking at this poem in manuscript version. I don't remember any that said our world. Each hath one and is one. That is, each is a little world. It's the Renaissance notion of the macrocosm, microcosm. Each of us is a microcosm of the whole world. Okay? So, let us possess one world. It's also, let me possess you and let you possess me. Each hath one, because I am a world. And you are a world. And so if I possess you, then I... You know. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. How so? Well, you got to get up really close, right? So that you can see your reflection in that other person's eye. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. True plain hearts. Rest where? Right here. Notice, got to be true, because false hearts, they look at you, but they're looking over here too. True plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres? Face, face. Without sharp north, without declining west. Why sharp, sharp, cold, frigid? Why declining west? A euphemism in England is somebody died, they went west. That's why Frodo, by the way, goes west. Leaves Middle Earth to the west. Whatever dies was not mixed equally. Your gloss, classical medical theory, held that disease was the result of improper balance. It's not just medical theory. It's classical physical theory. Okay. Aristotle said things decline because they're not properly mixed of equal parts. Earth, air, fire, and water. If they were mixed equally, it would last forever. If our two loves be one, and the two shall be one, or Thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. If our two loves are one, that is, if you love me the exact same way I love you, then what? Then our love can never die. It's pretty, right? It's beautiful. Until you ask the next question. Well, what if it does? Well, then it wasn't ever love to begin with, right? Keep going. It's your fault. Oh. <laughs> because my love is pure. I'm just going to say that all right. I mean, it wasn't me that was going seeking around other rooms. Okay. So notice the poem can be read. Oh, great, beautiful love poem. You know, everybody that we loved before, yeah, we were dreaming and we were asleep, but now we're fully awake. 
you have a way to fall asleep again. <laughs> Go from there to um, we'll skip that for now. How many of you have read the flea before? Okay, we'll do the flea. Page 920. This thing will probably take you 15 minutes. <clears throat> Dunn is credited for creating what are called metaphysical conceits. <clears throat> the term comes much later. The term is first introduced, <clears throat> I believe, by Dryden. And then Samuel Johnson essentially defines a metaphysical conceit as the violent yoking together of two dissimilar things. Okay? So, for example, in the flea, John, <coughs> John Dunn violently yokes together a flea with love. A marriage bed with a flea. Sex with a flea. Fleas on his mind. So, and elsewhere on the body. So, the flea. Mark, but this mark means pay attention to. Look at this flea. And this is kind of like a, a, um, a forerunner of the dramatic monologue genre. In a dramatic monologue like um, Browning's uh, My Last Duchess, okay? In a dramatic monologue, you've got a person who's speaking, and there's somebody listening. That person never replies. And the person who's speaking goes on along and accidentally betrays a little bit more about him or herself than was intended. That is, they give away some kind of dark aspect to their character. This is a dramatic, it's, it's a forerunner to a dramatic monologue in that you have a speaker addressing somebody who's obviously there and who does act within the course of the poem. We know that by what's said, but the speaker doesn't necessarily betray something about himself. So, mark but this flea and mark in this, that is note in this, how little that which thou denyest me is. So, the speaker's addressing somebody and we're told immediately the person being addressed is denying the speaker something. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea are two buds mingled be. I should have pointed this out before. Have I talked about the long F and the long S in the Renaissance? At beginnings of words, this is sometimes an S, and that is sometimes or that is an F. But, as I think it's safe to say often, not half the time, but I don't know, 30 or 40 percent of the time, scribes are copying on along and they don't put that. Okay. Or they're copying on along and at the beginning of a word that starts with an S, they put that. Go back to the good morrow for a minute. But suck on country pleasures. And imagine that written in manuscript form like this. And somebody, oops. See, Dunn and Shakespeare both pun on this orthography. Okay. Shakespeare has a line... There were the bee sucks, suck I. I have seen that in manuscript with this. There were the bee I. Right? Why? Because when these things, like Dunn's did, when these things circulate in manuscript, okay, what does that mean? They're not out there on the New York Times. They're, you know, you're giving them to your friends. Your friends are snickering. <laughs> oh, damn, that's good, John. And they give it to their friend. And they 
intentionally make that little screw up. Why? Because it's clear the word is suck. But visually, it's a pretty good pun. So, back to the flea. It sucked me first and now sucks thee. Okay. This is where this is really witty. Because what happens to the flea? It swells. And in this flea, our two buds mingled be. Well, yeah, that can happen by sucking. It can also happen the other way. Now, it might help to think not of a flea. But because we're in the South, a tick. Because, yeah, fleas do suck blood, but they don't swell up like a good old Rocky Mountain tick does. All right? So, and in this flea are two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. Ah, now we know what's being denied, the speaker. She won't sleep with him. Okay? So, why not? One, it's a sin. Two, I'll suffer shame. Three, I'll lose my virginity. So, the flea did all this, and you haven't sinned. You, haven't, you don't feel any shame. You haven't lost your virginity. And yet our bloods are mingling in this flea. And yet this joy enjoys before it woo. And this flea didn't even have to take you out for dinner. <laughs> and pampered swells with blood made of one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. Skip the alas for a moment. And this is more than we would do. What's the speaker saying to the person? Male speaker, female auditor. What's he saying isn't going to happen to her? You won't have, you won't swell pampered with one blood made of two. She's not going to get pregnant. He said, don't worry. I'm not going to get you pregnant. Alas. Okay? Between the first stanza and the second stanza, something happens. What? Look at the first line. Oh, stay three lives and one flea spare. Well, what did the first stanza begin with? Mark but this flea and mark in this. So look at this flea and blah, 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 blah. You haven't lost your virginity. You haven't suffered shame, and you haven't sinned. Okay. And yet, it's kind of like we had sex in the flea. You know. Yeah. Metaphysical conceit. I didn't say they were pretty. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like, ooh, heavenly bliss. You know. Okay. Oh, stay three lives and one flea spare. What has the person listening done? Taken that flea off. And now has that flea between... Thumbnail and finger. Stop. Stay three lives and one flea. How three lives? My life, your life, the flea's life. Okay. Where we almost, nay, more than married are. How can you be more than married? Can you be more than pregnant? No, you either are or you are not. Marriage is different. What can you claim about a marriage? Legality. Close. Kind of. Not really, but I'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> what can you appeal to the Pope for if you're Catholic? An annulment based upon? Consummation. Marriage wasn't consummated. You didn't have sex. So you can be married 40 years. And go to the Pope and say, never had sex. I want an omen. Why? Because she's pretty, you know, dirty old man with a trophy wife. That's how. So they are more than married. You go through the vows, and then you consummate the marriage. In this flea notice, we are more than married. Why? Because their bloods are mixing in the flea. This flea is you and I. Now that makes that 
conceit, that comparison, clear, right? This flea is you. Okay, so some guy sidles up next to uh, Jamie in a bar and goes, hey, baby, and blah, blah, blah. this flea is you. What's going to happen? Yeah. Either or <laughs> something's going to happen. It ain't going to be pretty. This flea is you and I, and this, okay, so let's just <laughs> extrapolate. Our marriage bed and marriage temple is. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking if I'm getting married, I'm not staying at a flea bag hotel. So how? Though parents grudge in you, we're met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. When I was working on the Dunbury Orm doctoral student, I found two copies of this poem that did not include those two lines about the parents and the cloister and living walls of jet. Nobody else had recorded those in published lists of, of Dunn's poetry. Why would you not include those two lines? What are they about? Mom and dad don't approve of you. That would be a pretty good reason to not include those two lines. So, though parents grudge and you grudge, she hasn't given in yet. We're met and cloistered. What does it mean to be cloistered? Locked up, door closed. Locked in, door closed. In these living walls of jet. Though use make you apt to kill me. That is an idiotic gloss. Habit. Though habit make you apt to kill me. What kind of habit? Go back to use. We've talked about, I think, in here, haven't we? About the Renaissance notion about sex and orgasm. That every time you have an orgasm, you kind of, you die a little bit. Your spirit dies a little bit. So, you will see Renaissance poets saying, Kill me. Who? Kill me again. Kill me again. Dunn has a poem in here that talks about falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising. Okay. Use make you apt to kill me, though your use of me make you apt to kill me. Let not to that self-murder had to be. Why? Because suicide is what? Unforgivable sin. Even though Dunn did write a book called Beathanatos, Self-Death, arguing for why suicide should be permissible. Okay? After he became a priest, he wrote that. Let not to that self-murder and it be in sacrilege three sins in killing three. Why is, why is killing three sacrilege? Trinity. It's the, the notion the idea of trinity, of threeness, okay? So between that stanza and the third stanza, what happens? She has that flea between her fingernail and her finger and pops it. How do you know? Cruel and sudden hast thou sent purple thy nail in blood of innocence. So now there's a bunch of blood on her fingernail, a little bit on her finger. And notice the blood is what? Of innocence. How so? His blood was innocent in that flea. Her blood was innocent in that flea. And the flea was innocent. Why? Because fleas aren't moral beings. Fleas don't go, Ooh, I like her skin color. I'm going to go up to her. That's weird. <laughs> fleas are just fleas. They're blood-sucking parasites. Okay? Wherein could this flea guilty be? Except in that drop which it sucked from thee. Yet thou triumphs. It's almost like she's getting her going, nee, 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 I killed your flea. Thou triumphs, and sayst that thou findst not thyself nor me the weaker now. And our speaker tightens the noose around her neck. You say that be even though the flea has died, that you're not any weaker now. You're right. Tis true. Then learn how false fears be. What are her fears? If I have sex with you, what? One, in the eyes of the church, it's a sin. Two, shame. Three, 
loss of virginity. Those are all fears. Learn how false fears be. Just so much honor when thou yieldst to me will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. Oh, how much honor is that? It's infinitesimal. Okay? It's honor, though. Because when she does yield to him, assuming she's one to begin with, she will lose her virginity. He's not saying, no, 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 no. No, no, we're going to do something else. No. no, no, you will lose that. But your honor, what's he getting at by honor? Well, partly at least what he's getting at is who's going to know? It's not like you're going to, as they did in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, newlyweds, to prove the marriage was consummated, take the bloody sheets and hang them out the windows. Okay? To prove. He said, no, we're not going to do that. So, give in. Now, some people read this as, you know, I'll pick up a couple minutes when the women come back. Um, I might give you till Thursday, the week after break, to turn your paper. Haven't decided yet. Just keep plugging on along. It'd be so nice. That'd be wonderful. You do like that's what I would do. That's what I would do. 